All right. Uh, <clears throat> so this lecture is about American Sniper, which uh, has been so far the most popular film to come out of either the wars in Iraq or Afghanistan. And uh, there have been <clears throat> other films which have followed this lead um, <clears throat> now that basically this, this has proven to be the way to make money for Hollywood. And so they have tried to follow this idea of sort of making effectively again what are westerns um, but and they've had some more success before this very little success um, which is instructive so I'm gonna you know as usual talk show film talk show film you'll see here the uh, things I'm gonna main points I'm gonna talk about the six main points I'm gonna st start by talking about um, but for the moment, what you need to what I want you to focus on is I want you to take take a look take a hard look at this film because people adored it and they still do, and it is a serious, uh, it's seriously dangerous film, basically because it, um, and you will see why I guess uh, is, is let me let me as we work through it you'll see is like okay what what is the danger here because it looks like a standard sort of. You know, combat film about a guy and his wife, they're Texans, you know, and so on. Okay, so uh, the film starts off, so here I'm talking about dehistoricizing, and what that really means is that you take a text and you, and you pull it out of its history. So you render it, you sort of uh, kind of render it with, you use as, as little technology that will identify the text as possible. You don't make specific reference to historical events. Um, so it's hard to figure out exactly when was it, when did it occur? It's like, you know, you can sort of tell by the way that people dress. And if you are familiar with technology, you can say, oh, you know, they didn't have, oh, look, they didn't have smartphones yet, or they did have smartphones, or, you know, or look at the cars they were driving, or, you know, whatever it might be. So there are going to be ways that you can narrow it down to a point. But if you don't know the specific event, events, basically, then you're like, well, looks like it happened sometime in this period, you know, from, say, in this case, sometime in the late 90s to sometime in the, I don't know, 15 years later, like, could have been any time in there. And what's very strong about that is that if you, if you take it out of its historical context, then you can't make sense of it as a political document as easily. And so you are required to treat it as a sort of fable, right? At the same time, because it's recognizably our world, you think, no, but it is, it is making political commentary, right? So look at the difference between a film like this, which is deliberately dehistoricizes, doesn't tell you any dates, doesn't tell you exactly what's happened, doesn't, you know, uh, doesn't make reference to a specific president or to so-and-so's policies or anything like that. Um, doesn't show you where exactly you are. You're not really clear. It's like, so where are we now? Like, what does that mean? I mean, what's the contest here about? What's the, the... So you're not clear, right? It's sort of generic, a generic war story about Iraq. Um, well, think about this in terms of, say, Lavaki's uh, Aimé de Vaou, which is also a fable, right? But it's, it says, I'm a fable. And it starts off with women dancing on their way to the cemetery. So you're like, wow, that's that doesn't happen, you know. <laughs> Whereas here, you look at it and it's like, but this looks like it could all happen. In fact, it probably did happen. Now, the thing about this film that's particular genius, directed by Clint Eastwood, um, who was an action film star and a hard right winger, and has been for decades, um, and partly libertarian. Uh, was the mayor of Carmel actually? He, he was. He wanted to be the. He wanted to be the mayor for one term so he could make sure that development got stopped in Carmel. <laughs> it's so it's so libertarian. It's like I'll make use of the system, then I'm out of the system. You don't believe in it. Um, so here Eastwood does not make claims at the beginning or at the end of the movie saying this is based on a true story, which is fascinating because. It means that it leaves it up to you. So if you claim this is this really happened, this is a true story. It's like that's on you. He didn't say that. You know, the creator didn't say that. It's like okay, so this is very interesting. So in dehistoricizing, 
the text that is in, in taking the text and yank pulling it out of its this is kind of like grabbing the head and the spine and pulling them out of the body and you're saying don't worry about the body you know all that matters is basically where these ideas come from you know, the idea is fundamentally about what it is to be a good killer um, and there there is such a thing okay and that's uh, now the book which <clears throat> um, this is sort of based on is a book by Chris Kyle and at least I think it was two other guys who <laughs> wrote it with him because Kyle obviously couldn't tell a story to <laughs> I would say to save his life but but it, uh, he got killed um, but in the book he says so he, he obviously you know told his story to a couple of guys who then made it into uh, a sort of series of events and the series of events really covers an arc of Kyle's life from the point that he uh, joins the SEALs to the point that basically he gets killed um, and he gets killed because he, he doesn't get killed in Iraq he, uh, he comes home from Iraq and he starts train he starts taking badly wounded veterans out to his like he has a shooting range in this, so Texas so Texan and um so he takes out this one guy who is unstable, quote unquote unstable, and nobody's with them. And the guy shoots him, basically. So that's how Kyle gets killed. Um, he gets killed by an American uh, who he's trying to help. And uh, so he, he goes down as this martyr. Um, so that's sort of the truth about, you know, Chris Kyle's, uh, the arc of his story. So these two dudes uh, put the book together uh, to sort of make it work and in the book he says repeatedly that he loves war and he wants to go back and the only thing that really that prevents him from going back is his wife uh Taya, who sort of blackmails him because he keeps he's just in love with it i mean he just loves killing and he's not at all there, there, there's this sort of moment in the film where you'll see at the end he, he's like oh you know that's it i'm ready to come home it's like no, he's never ready to come home he's like ah this is great terrific um okay so let's look at these first uh, two clips. The first one is his, he and his brother are watching, um, or they're, 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 they're on the, this is when he's on the rodeo circuit with his brother, which he does talk about actually in the book. Um, and, uh, and then, and the, the, bombing at Dar es Salaam occurs <clears throat> in Tanzania um, and also in Nairobi and Kenya um, and they just show it to you but they and there's they actually show you file footage from the film from the television at the time and he's like look what they did to us <laughs> he's, he's such an idiot he's still out and um, but he's a simple little boy you know, and so on and then the next uh, shot is uh, him with his wife Taya um, with not the famous 9-11 attacks okay so watch these two things and then uh, I'll come back on she's not right man we're cowboys we're living the dream this is a special report those explosions set to go off at the U.S. embassies in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania and Nairobi, Kenya were clearly a part of someone's war against the United States. More than 80 dead, more than 1,700 injured in two bomb blasts hey, today, yeah. which exploded yeah. just minutes and hey. 450 miles oh, apart. Yes. It is still unclear at this hour who our enemy is. Although the embassies were obviously the targets, oh, most of the dead and injured are not Americans. Still, eight Americans, including one child, are dead, and five are still missing. Well, exactly which is the north side and which is the south side, but it appears it's coming out of the north side now. And then, moments ago, these incredible images. I believe that's the first one. That's the south tower collapsing. It almost looks like one of those implosions. Okay, so you've seen these now, and the... The issue really is, is that there are no issues for him. The main, the main thing is, it's like, well, what, what is it that caused the attacks on Dar es Salaam, in Tanzania and in Nairobi, Kenya? Like, what, what was it in 1998? Well, these are early Bin Laden attacks, right? So, they're gonna, they're, they're gonna lead up to, uh, the attacks of 9/11, which is why they show them to you. But 
the film doesn't say at all. It's like, well, and you know, they they've got uh, not Roger Mudd there, but Peter, something like Peter Arnett or oh, I can't remember who that is. Uh, one of those big brainless anchors, who you know, just you know, was always pushing the party line. Says, you know, we don't know who our enemy is. And, you know, it's like, oh, nonsense. They knew who the enemy was. <laughs> They maybe didn't tell the networks right at this point, but um, it's not as though this came from nowhere. The you, the reason that like wh why, for instance, didn't uh, Bin Laden attack, say, I don't know, the German embassy, you know, or the Canadian embassy for that matter? It's like, well, it probably has something to do with the, your politics in the area, right? Like, why do you get, why do you have an embassy get suddenly attacked? It's like, it probably, there probably was a cause. Um, especially if it's organized, which means that somebody is able to mass a bunch of, of a political will behind them to say, we are going to attack this, and people are going to go, yeah, we're going to go through with that. Especially, in, like, and if you say, this may be a suicide mission for a bunch of you, people are like, we're in with that. It's like, wow, really? Okay, this must be really important. So in other words, What's the political issue? Well, the film doesn't care about that. So in 9-11, it's like, all you need to do is see the two towers coming down. That's enough. You know, that's just enough. It's like, okay, they hit us. They hit us first. It's like, wait. So people just bombed the two towers, the Pentagon and this one flight in uh, Pittsburgh that uh, basically, you know, uh, suddenly became a flying bomb. That's just, it just happened like that? Or was there more? Was there, as we've been talking about, as I've been talking about, you know, for the last whatever hours, you know, was there 20 years or more of history of the United States um, with its hands deep in the, the guts, basically, of the Middle East, moving things around and trying to basically organize the body of politic the way it wanted it organized? It's like, so, you know, was there cause? Was there something? that made people do this? Or were they just crazy Muslims? They were just like, oh, that's it. They just went off their rocker because they're all crazy, you know, crazy brown people, and that's it. Okay, so it's like, which one? As far as we're concerned, as far as the film is concerned, it's the crazy brown people one. It's like, no, there's no cause. They just hit us. And he keeps saying, you know, is it, you know, say, payback for rendition and torture of Islamic militants between Albania and Egypt? Nah, <laughs> you know, like who wants to know about that? You know, what talk about policy? We don't talk about policy here. We're we're Americans. You know, we 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 like our film simple. We like our text simple. That's it. That's all you need to know. You're with your wife. They attacked. Uh, they attacked the twin towers in New York. That's it. 